but I felt like it was a cool way to share information without it feeling like here's a fact sheet coldy dieback spray your shoes blah, blah 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 instead it was like oh what's that person doing why is that guy climbing in that tree what's that about so kind of just like um a different way of of sharing i guess Hello everyone and welcome to Canon Conversations, the the show where I sit down with some of the top creators in the industry so that you can become a better photographer. On today's show, we're going to be diving into how we can make a difference with our photography. If you've got a cause you believe in, something you feel passionate about and you want to and, and you think, how can I help through my photography? Today's episode is for you. And to uh, walk us through um, uh, a really awesome um, uh, photo project that she's been working on on recently, we have uh, professional photographer Michelle Hislop. Michelle, thanks for joining me. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Awesome. Um, For everyone at home, do you want to give us a bit of a, uh, to start us off, a bit of a rundown on your history with photography and a bit of your background? Yeah, sure. So um, I've been a photographer for about 15 years. I was a very creative child. Um, I was kind of like painting and creating wearable art and entering colouring in competitions and that kind of thing. Um, so I was I was really into physical like painting um, in my kind of like last year of school and, and did photography as well. And I actually got a really poor mark in photography that year, but I felt like there was something in it that I really liked. Um, so yeah, I went, I, I finished school and I just did work experience, um, tried to get an apprenticeship as a sign writer and they thought I wouldn't probably climb up ladders in the rain. Um, so, so I didn't get the, didn't get the apprenticeship. Um, and then I did work experience with the newspaper in Tauranga where I'm from. And I was like, oh, this is it. I'm sold. Just absolutely loved it. Um, and and they had just bought digital cameras. So even though I'd trained on film cameras, the digital had just come in. So, you know, they gave me a backpack full of gear and I was able to just like roam around and play with it and learn about the lenses and hold things for them. So I think that's where I, where I kind of, um, yeah, f- fell in love with it, I guess. Mm, nice. And before we go... Um I guess in depth on your project on the Cody dieback prevention yeah. specifically. Do you want to give us a bit of a rundown on the kind of the broader spectrum of your professional photography? Yeah, sure. So um, newspaper work and magazine work is kind of like the main the main stuff that I've done. Um, and now things are changing a bit because um, a lot of the magazines that I used to work for have recently shut down. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think the other kind of bread and butter work that I do is, uh, you know, like corporate headshots and photographing for businesses. And um, it's, you know, it's it's totally fine and it's um, not very difficult to do. And it means that I can spend my time doing projects that I want to do as well. Mm. And how do you feel like your that sort of broad range of your work has affected your photography rather than specializing in each. Because w- when I look at your photography, um, you know, like, like say you're more like photo journalist photography, like the Cody Dieback yeah. um, project, it's got a really crisp sort of polished look to it, which I feel mm. can only like be, you know, that, that has to do something with your really formal crisp you know, portrait work that you do as well. That's got to yeah. be referencing back and forth there. I think you've probably hit the nail on the head. It's almost like each area that I've spent a bit of time in, there's stuff that kind of crosses over between them. Mm. So um, I, there was a while there where I was photographing a lot of people inside their houses, showing the houses. And after that, I couldn't do any shots that didn't have perfectly vertical verticals. And um, it became just one of those extra things to have to look at and I think as well with um, portrait work you know you I think a lot of it you know the lighting and stuff like that it's really easy to learn and it's you know it can just become a bit of a standard thing but Mm. to get someone to feel comfortable enough with you that they'll kind of 
look into the camera and you can tell it's not it's something real and genuine I think that 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 is a skill that can be honed um and I think that's probably I, I feel like people is the thing people is the subject that I mm-hmm. always love shooting um mm-hmm. even if there's a landscape I kind of want to have a person somewhere in there um and I think it's that thing of a, a combination of building something together where it's not just me trying to get this thing um it's the two of us kind of collaborating to make a picture and it's kind of nice because there's that challenge of not knowing what you're going to get getting something and um and then putting their trust in you mm, absolutely and on a previous episode um i talked with another photographer about um exactly that the kind of the the soft skills of photography you know mm. um interacting with um, people and making that connection and yeah. that kind of like fast turnaround um you know portrait work where you're having to like interact with people quickly um you know that's definitely a way that you you that you would have built up those soft skills to then bring them into your photo journalist work in order to connect with people quickly when it matters um you know to go deeper with that sort of storytelling and to kind of like transition now into your sort of more photo photo all good AirPods. Why yeah, would you? Yeah, it just fell right out. I'm not used to. <laughs> Sorry, pineapple, can you pineapple. just finish that last bit of the sentence? Yeah, no worries. Um, I guess to transition now into your, um, your more photojournalist at work, your with your project on the Cody dieback mm. prevention specifically. How did that project come about? Um, was it an issue that you were familiar with beforehand? Yeah, it was. Um, I used to do a lot of trail running out in the Waitakere Ranges. So um, probably for five years before doing the project, that was the place that I'd go to a few times every week. And I had a community of friends and we'd meet up there on weekends and spend hours in the bush together. Um, So as soon as I started running there, you know, it was like there were signs and spray things and we, we would all talk about it as a group and be really careful. Um, but then when the Rahui and the closure came in, um, it was it was quite heartbreaking because it was kind of like, wow, oh, this is our place. Well, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And um, I guess as well, what, what I was finding was that there was a lot of people saying different things and having different ideas about it, like are the, um, the pig hunters spreading Koldi dieback themselves by going in there to get rid of pigs, they shouldn't be allowed to go in there or, um, you know, wondering what the scientists were doing and what had they thought of and what were they testing. And I did quite a bit of looking around online and um, it, it seemed like at that time there wasn't very much information. The information was that was there was the same stuff that had been there for a few years. And, um, and, and it's understandable. It's a very complex, multifaceted issue, but um, I, I guess I just felt like, ah, oh, I really want to understand more. I want to know the different sides. I want to know who is affected by this. And, um, yeah, so pretty much um, I saw that there was um, the Canon Grant program was going, and I thought, actually, this would be a really cool thing to do. And I was very terrified at the thought of it as well because it was a, a huge endeavour and it's always scary doing something that you haven't done before. Um, but I put together an application and and I got it. So yeah, that that's what the start of it. Yeah, nice. And let's um let's talk sort of um, nuts and bolts now about the project itself. What was involved? Who was involved? Yeah. How long did it take? How did you sort of start to make those connections with the people? Yeah. So I um, when I was kind of like deciding how I would do it I actually did a full project brief for myself so I wrote down the types of people that I would want to um, interview I did interviews as well as photographs Um, and so I wanted to um, interview people in the area of Mataronga Māori which is um, using natural plants as remedies um, you know for kauri dieback I wanted to talk to scientists volunteers um, people that lived in the in the Waitakere Ranges and how it was affecting their life, um, local businesses, 
people that were recreationally using it otherwise and how it had affected them. So um, I, I wanted to get quite a broad spe- spectrum of different types of people. Um, and luckily, because of the bush running that I that I was doing, I already knew maybe four or five people that I felt like these would be cool people to interview, like um, Sarah Hillary, and that's um, Sir Edmund Hillary's daughter is someone that I would run with. So I asked her if I could photograph her because the Hillary Trail is named mm. after her dad. So um, you know to get her perspective and. One of the other runners, he owned the Huya Cafe, probably still does own it, um, and talking about how, you know, that had affected his business and a friend that had um, gotten into pest trapping as a way to um, help the situation. So I started with people that I knew, and then once I had a few images under my belt, I could show the next person who maybe I didn't know, this is what I've done so far, this is mm. how I've done it, um, and... It, it was a bit of a snowball once, you know, the, the bigger it got, the bigger it got. I ended up photographing about maybe 26 different people. Um, and each of those people would be a full few hours of shooting, doing audio recording, interviewing. I drove up um, like way to the top of the North Island and down to Rotorua. So, yeah, it was it was great. I, I spent about probably eight months altogether on the photography part yeah mm-hmm. yeah so it, it seems like it seemed like the kind of the the story and stuff like developed over time you're sort of like hunting out exactly you know sort of following your nose around like talk to this person talk to this person sort of slowly figured out hon- hon- honing in on on um the story you were going to tell um yeah uh what was your sort of process of trying to figure that out and uh, was there any sort of like standout like yeah, like characters or stories that sort of led you down down the way? Yeah, um, so many amazing stories. I think I was just talking nonstop about all the interesting people that I was meeting. Um, there was, I went, so I'd go along to all the kind of community meetings as well. And there was one that I went to and a man named Kevin Prime spoke there and he was explaining the use of karakia um, to protect the trees on his property mm-hmm. and after the meeting I was really terrified but went and talked to him and I asked him if I could photograph him and he said oh well, you, you know I'm, I'm going back home tomorrow I said yeah I could photograph you on your property with your with your Kauri and um, he was amazing we, we went up my partner and I went up together and we ca- car camped on his land and um, he took us around all these very special places to a, a waterfall that is his kind of special waterfall and taught us about even the um, the reasons why different mountains are called what they are, stories that you'd, you'd never hear about otherwise. Mm. So I, I think that that was when I, yeah, when I photographed him, I was like, oh, we've got it, like, it, it was it was kind of early on, and I think it really gave me that confidence that this was going to be a very well rounded story, a, a cross section of of all these different things. And um, so, yeah, I think he was he was very special. There were so many amazing people, but we'd be here for hours. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's um, one of the key elements, though. Right, is that if you want um, the the voice of the project to have any kind of depth. It needs to go beyond simply your opinion and your and your your voice saying oh, yeah. what you've already got in your head. You need you need to go out there, yeah. talk to loads of different people, get loads of different perspectives, and eventually that bubbles down into um, something much more rich than just one person's opinion. Oh yeah. Hmm. Well, I I pretty much did it without my opinion at all. Um, I I let people explain their experiences hmm. in their own words. Um, and then a friend of mine, Andrea, uh, was very nice of her. She she kind of took the quotes and the recordings that I'd made with them and made it into much better writing than I ever could have. Um, so, yeah, it was and, – and then each piece of writing that was finished with their quotes, I sent that to them, got them to check that it was still the same – like the right thing, this is what they were saying, changed any little bits that they wanted changed – 
so there's a lot of um, organization and um, collaboration and like yeah it was there was a lot involved in all of that mm. but I I really wanted to do justice to everyone that I had photographed and make sure that I was telling their story in the way that felt right. Mm. Do you, like, yeah. Can you talk a, bit, talk a little bit about the um, how that collaborative process with working with like a different kind of creative, like a writer, um, yeah. you know, like how that affected the process compared to it being just you solo as a photographer? On your own? Well, I was the own. I was the only. It, it really was um, me on my own because I mm. was capturing all the audio, mm. interviewing them, all of that, and then um, it was just pretty much. I had we had the exhibition, and I was thinking, I don't know how I'm going to get these into good captions. I'm not really mm. sure what to do. Um, so I just, you know, I asked Andrea, and um, and so I think I think it was quite good because I would just say to her, look. Um, this bit of audio from here to here, mm. I felt like that was really meaningful or really important. Mm. So she'd make sure she got those key sections. And I'd even maybe say, this was the vibe I felt when I was there. Mm. And she, I think she nailed it. Yeah. She's far better at words, you know? So <laughs> yeah, it was, I was lucky to have her help, definitely. Yeah, nice. And um, in terms of how you approached the project and in terms of making it making sure it would resonate with people because it's it's like it's one thing for it to like feel good for you and for you to show it to your like close little circle and to go mm. yep that's cool how do you then yeah. sort of make sure it's going to resonate with a much wider audience and have much further reach mm. well I, I don't know if at the beginning you do know if it will or not but um i guess I had a feeling that this was an important thing, an important thing to to tell, to dive into, to research, to share with the masses. I kind of felt like um, if I can't find out all this information that I really want to know, well, probably there's other people in the same boat. Um, and it did seem like there was, there's like a very tight circle of people who are all working in the area, but then there are also these kind of um, lapses in communication so um it was quite cool when we had the opening night of the exhibition a lot of the people i'd photographed came along and then quite a few of them spoke and there was this kind of way of people connecting and yeah it felt really special it felt like it um it wasn't about me and it was about these are all these people's stories um mm. and i and i you know we we had the exhibition publicly displayed outside under the trees of Albert Park, and it was quite interesting. People, I'd sometimes just kind of like watch and see what people would do when they walked through there. And yeah, people would stop and read the signs, or you know, maybe just look at a couple of photos. But but I felt like it was a cool way to share information without it feeling like here's a fact sheet, Coldy mm. Dybeck, spray your shoes, blah 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 blah. Mm. Instead, it was like, ah, oh, what's that person doing? Why is that guy climbing in that tree? What's that about? So kind of just like um, a different way of, of sharing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And maybe a feeling of empathy as well. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what I want to transition into talking about now. And this is kind of what mm -hmm. I consider to, like the meat of this conversation is around like that idea of like we're not, you know, scientists or like sort of conservationists we're not like sort of like on the ground doing the work figuring out no. the science of things on how to actually fix the issue but what no. do you, what role do you feel like photography and other kind of creative storytelling mediums play in situations like this yeah i think um it's quite cool there are these people that have been doing this for years and years and years and mm. i don't think they you know a lot of them they don't get any recognition no one in the media talks specifically to them. Um, even talking about what they do on a personal level and how it affects them as opposed to facts and figures, I I feel like it's really interesting to, to know what they're doing and validating as well that here they are pouring their heart and soul into, you know, maybe researching something for years and years and years and years and they don't even know what the result is will be but they just keep trying um so yeah i really commend them for the work that they do and i guess as a storyteller 
I'm privileged that I have kind of the means to share those stories. So it's, mm. um, yeah, I feel really lucky to be able to do that. Yeah. And I think it was going back yeah. to what you said earlier around um, how you watched people interact with the photos um, compared to how mm. they would interact with uh, a fact sheet of like, this is what yeah. you should and shouldn't do with, you know, to spread Cody die back. People were kind of um, resonating with the people in the photographs and, and, yeah. and, and, and their stories and wanting to know more and stuff. So it's, like I guess it's a way of bringing people in and piquing their interest for a subject in a mm. in a much softer way than just throwing facts in front of them as yeah and yeah, I think yeah. yeah I think that that's pretty much it it's like um, mm. a different way of showing information and mm. I really wanted it to be available for anybody to see rather than um, inside a gallery which can be quite exclusive, even if it's a free one. I think there's a lot of people who maybe don't feel so comfortable, but if you're just walking through the park anyway and you see things, mm. then it, yeah, it just it was a bit of an equalizer, I think. And my yeah, my reasoning was to share information with the public. So mm. I felt like it, it worked well. Nice, yeah. cool. Um, as we kind of round out the the show now um in mm. terms of the the project do you have any further plans with it or is there anything similar on the horizon for you yeah um i was looking into turning the work into a book mm. but with the current financial kind of climate i think that's probably not wise now um and I, so what i've done is i've just published all of the work on my website and it's all available there. People can read about it, look at the photographs. So mm -hmm. that's where you can get it at the moment. Um, and I also, I'm definitely interested in exhibiting elsewhere. I'd quite like to take it up to like Northland area. Um, so it's a bit, it's quite a big process doing an outdoor exhibition in terms mm -hmm. of getting permissions. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something that I'm definitely keen on. Um, yeah. So, but I, but I feel like with the Cody Dieback project, I kind of feel like um, right now I'm good with what I with with the work that I did. Mm -hmm. It might be something that would be cool to kind of revisit in five years' time mm -hmm. and kind of like see catch up with some of those same people and see if the research has resulted in anything interesting and mm -hmm. kind of do a bit of a catch up. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm feeling okay on that one for now. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I have just started a new personal project, but it's too early for me to talk about it. Um, and, and I'm in that stage where it's still quite scary and new. Mm -hmm. I've written all my planning out of kind of what I'm thinking I want to do. Um, and, it, and it's also like what we were talking about earlier where, mm -hmm. um, the story, I still have to find the story and I can mm -hmm. only find that by interacting with people and getting their stories. So it's kind of like I've thrown out a few ideas and once I start shooting and, and meeting these mm. people, then um, I feel like I'll be able to talk about it better because yeah. I'll, I'll know what the story is. Yeah, yeah. but I guess so. in, in terms of to obviously not talk specifics, but is yeah. there anything that you've learnt from the Cody Dybrak project that you will be taking into your, your next Definitely. project? Definitely. Um, I've learned so much through it. Um, I think something something that I gained was the confidence that even if a project feels very scary at the beginning and you don't have all the answers for how it's going to work and how it's going to look, that's okay. Um, do as much research as you possibly can. I'm a real fan of – I just love researching anyway, um, but I, I'll try and uh, – the subject that I'm going to be doing something on, I look for all kinds of areas of research. What have other photographers done? Are there any movies on it? What about mm. like old posters and whatever? So I, I just do, so I collect heaps of images, put together mood boards. I talk to a couple of people that I trust their opinion. I go, what do you think about this? How do you think that would work? What would be wrong with it? Um, so I feel like the prep part is really it's quite good because it helps to give you confidence and there is a certain amount of confidence you need to have to just 
get your first shoot done. Um, I've yeah also um, learned how if you don't have all the people or at the beginning, it's okay because once you photographed a couple of people and met them, and then you can just say to them, hey, you know, do you know anybody else that might be keen or that this would suit? And, and pretty often they, they're keen to help you out. If they've had a good experience with you and they feel like you've represented them well, then they're going to be keen to, like, yeah, put you in touch with a, another friend or family member or someone who's, who's so, so um, yeah. I might just check my notes if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, I'll just read that. Okay. Um, so I feel like a really good question to ask yourself when you're doing a project like this is what makes me feel frustrated? What feels like an injustice? Is there something, whether it's for the environment or people or, um, you know, maybe it's like someone who's being discriminated against. Like for me, these are things that I get really riled up and it keeps me up at night. And um, so often those types of things will just be kind of brewing away in my mind. And then it might come to a point where I'll go, ah, I could actually see that how that could work as a photography project or an exhibition. Mm-hmm. And, and also I feel like I'm going to want to do that if I feel like there's something good that could come of doing it as, as an exhibition. So not taking those photos for me, but almost doing something for them, sharing their stories mm-hmm. for them. Um, and it, I think it also means that in terms of the photographs, they're not always going to be like the most amazing photograph I've ever taken, but it's sharing a genuine moment of that person. Um, and it's, yeah, I, I kind of feel like the story becomes more important mm-hmm. than the photography. But if you can still take a pretty photo, awesome. Like, that always feels good as a photographer, eh? mm. um, Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm cool. just going to check this again. And I guess to oh, yeah, finish, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, just to sort of, t- to finish us off, I guess in terms of any other advice for photographers around, like if, mm. like if there are photographers who want their work to make an impact, um mm what are some of the things that they can think about any, and, and even in the idea around like um, feeling certain on the, the idea that photography can make an impact, mm. you know, like just the role of photography in issues like this. Yeah. I think photography is, is very powerful. Um, sometimes when you see an image and it makes you feel a certain way, then you're going to actually have, consider more what is that photographer trying to say or what is the issue that we're seeing here. So I think it I think it's crucial and um, probably a combination of that and as well, like, you know, film, like moving photography. I think doing a bit of a combination, interviewing people, gathering audio, um, doing a – I think it's quite good these days if you can do a little bit more of a multimedia approach mm. – um, because just straight photos, you know, you're going to probably put it on your social media, on your website. It's quite good to have those extra things to play with and it helps to kind of bring your message in. Um, like the new project that I'm going to be working on and just gathering audio from them, but I want to set up a page where you can see the image and hear the person speaking mm-hmm. as you go through their images. So, um, yeah, I think trying to think a little bit um, of – what's an interesting way I could do it? How could I, if you're with someone or you're in a certain place for a while, it's like you might as well collect as much as you can so you've got a bit more to play with afterwards. Mm. Um, and what was your first question? Oh, just around any tips for um, photographers who want their work to make an impact. And I think one mm. of those sticking points is around what to focus on. What is the issue I'm going to, mm. you know, I chase down because I think that's quite a roadblock for people um yeah do you have any advice for you know like especially like young creatives who kind of have this whole world laid out in front of them um and there's lots of issues that yeah yeah. there's lots of issues that feel like they could do with attention on and how do you hone in on what's going to be your story to follow I mean I guess thinking that you've got the rest of your life to do this helps 
it to feel like you don't have to just choose one issue and that's you forever. Um, you know, if it's topical or if, if you feel like it's about to become topical, great. Even if it's something that hasn't done anything in the media yet, but you can see that, hey, this is an issue. Why has nobody talked about this? I think photograph stuff that you know in your community because you're going to have those connections already and then, you know, if, if you're starting from scratch, people are going to wonder a little bit maybe about your intentions. But if, if these are people in your community anyway, that's like half the job done, they're going to trust you a little bit more. I would say be very open with your reason for doing it. Tell them about you, who you are, give them your why, because if they understand that, then they're going to give you, you know, like that information, they'll open up. But I think like I'm, I'm always really clear. I'll say, look, this is a personal project. I'm not associated with, you know, that I'm not getting paid to do this. It's not for the hero. This is just, you know, this is just something I want to do. And this is why I want to do it. Um, so, yeah, I think if you're a young person, like it's so cool. You'll have access to all these people, even Facebook groups. I often try and find people on Facebook. If I can find a group that's associated with that specific issue, join that group, listen for a couple of weeks, get involved a little bit before you maybe put your post on there and then just see who responds. Meet that person once you've got their trust, you know, then then you're going to find it's easier. But I, I'd say just maybe if you're like, oh, I just don't know what to do, just find one thing in your community, do that. Then once you've done that project, you'll probably start noticing projects everywhere that you could mm. you could do, and just just one at a time. Yeah, I yeah I really like that as as a thing to focus on to focus on your c- c- community. You know, to go back to mm. what you were saying right at the beginning of um, the episode and how you um, you know um, made your sort of progress through the Cody Dieback project. How you started with your community. And then totally. used those stories to, um, you know, uh, get buy-in from people outside yep. your community. You know, you start in with the trust that you already have and then use, yeah. what, you know, the stuff you create to build trust outside of that and grow and go and go from there. So, yeah, I think that's a fantastic yeah. um, piece, of, yeah. piece of advice. Oh, cool. cool. Awesome. Well, yeah. um, I think that's going to be a great place to finish up. Um, okay, thank you so cool. much, Michelle, for coming on the show. Um, for anyone yeah, at home who's you. interested in uh, reading more about uh, Michelle's uh, project and her work, we're going to have uh, links below. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. I had a, I had a great time um, chatting. Yeah, I did too. Thank you, Ben. And thanks for, I don't know, yeah, asking questions about it. It's always nice to talk about things that you've spent hours doing. So yeah, I appreciate you. And, and even the question's really well thought out, so thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Cool. Yeah. All right, well, that's going to do us, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. See ya. Awesome.